Hey everybody, Mo Bunnell here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Today I've got Reed Davis, and this is our first of five episodes with Reed. He's CEO of McGriff, one of the largest commercial insurance brokerages out there. And in the 10 years or so that I've known Reed, I've seen him go from one of their top producers nationwide, I guess really worldwide, to leading one of their biggest markets, to leading the entire organization and becoming CEO. It's a really cool story, and it and we dig into sort of what that transformation has looked like with Reed in this particular episode and the kind of things that he did day to day to get there. So we're going to get to that in a minute. Now know that if you have to deepen relationships and you need to do it quickly, then go to growbigplaybook.com. That's where you can instantly download our latest thought piece on how you can deepen relationships very, very quickly. There's actually seven ways to do it, scripts you can use to, to add value, tailor, customize, and make your own tons of value in it and you can get it in a, in a minute or two by by signing up over at growbigplaybook.com. All right, here's Reed Davis. Hey everybody, welcome to Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm with Reed Davis. He's CEO of McGriff. And Reed, man, I, I've always enjoyed working with you. And I think one of the things you bring to the table as a very, very senior leader at one of the largest brokerages and insurance insurance brokerages in the nation is this idea that you were you were a college level athlete and then you had success being a high end producer. I mean one of the most successful people I know that does what you do. And I think that grit that you had as an athlete helps you do it. So when you think about um you know the moment that that you wanted that you realized that growth is something you want to focus on. Tell me that story. I know, well, I, I know a little bit about it, but tell me the story from the beginning. How did you sort of wander into production and realize, hey, this is something that I want to grab onto? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, it's an interesting thought process to go through to realize, you know, you find your destiny and find the things that you're looking for. But, you know, Mo, I think it, it, it started pretty early on when I walked onto the baseball field at the University of Georgia and I looked around and said, I better figure something else out real quick because these guys are really good and I'm not. Um, so I wanted to, uh, uh, but I also recognize that you can learn to compete and life is about competition in my world, in my mind, you do compete. There's a scoreboard in life. There's certain things that go on, whether it's economic, it's emotional, it's certain types of things you learn to, um, you know, you, there's a winner and loser in a lot of situations. And, but that doesn't mean somebody has to win and lose. It's just how you measure success is based on certain aspects and, and the scoreboard in front of you, which if we were talking about the other day, it's, you know, my world has become an enabler. So my scoreboard is changing. My scorecard is changing on how I measure success. It's becoming very interesting when it comes more from affirmation than it does from something that you actually see in day in, day out from your activities. But, you know, moving forward as I, you know, as I moved into my career and I got out of college and I went into a risk management staff oriented role with a large corporation in Atlanta, I'll uh, never forget sitting in Conway, Arkansas with two individuals. One was the CFO of the, work of the, of the company and uh, the other one was general manager of the division. And they made a statement to me collectively one night. Um, we were there for some after shift meetings and they said, Reed, you know, if you really want success and you want to hone your career and the things that you go on in your business, you really need to think about being in the business of the business. And it took me a little while to really understand what that meant. Um, but what I know what they were trying to do is get me to move to Conway, Arkansas, and that wasn't going to happen. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it left you with a couple of thoughts. It's an operational direction, control, management, or, you know, it's sales, it's business. To me, it looked like it was selling. You understand the business. You were able to grow the business. You have an impact on what's going on if you have the products and services and things behind it. Um, so naturally, I progressed into that. And then I moved into, you know, the insurance brokerage business, and I was at a firm that frankly, was best in class from a technical capacity, but they really weren't a very good sales organization. They no longer exist today, and I think that's a big part of it. Um, but you recognize, wait a minute, something's missing here. So I pivoted to a couple of other organizations where uh, the sales were where I was able to learn and spend more time in a sales-oriented environment. Yeah, but, it, you know, it just it, it happened because I did recognize, too, Mo, that, you know, to Sales and new business development to me uh, transcends everything, but it is the most, it gives you the most opportunity for in career. You know, if you can be 
learn to be uncomfortable being uncomfortable it gives you transferability of skills it gives you protection if you can do this you're able and you have the willingness and the grit and the, and the to go after it, the competitive nature you're always going to be able to find a job and and at a young age that's pretty you know that's pretty compelling well, let, let, me, let me ask you follow-ups. I know that you were deeply influenced by your dad and some of the things he said. And you're also, you know, for the audience to know, you're one of the most successful producers I've ever met. And because of that and your leadership qualities, now you've become CEO of one of the biggest brokerages in America. So, like, w w when you think about your dad, your upbringing, and the idea of playing the long game, well, you know, what did you learn from him? How do you apply that? Just, just run with that. Yeah, so my dad was a good Southern lawyer, um, good man, did a lot of really interesting things, did a lot for the family and kids, and, and it helps you understand it. But we used to talk about different types of things and what success means. And, and being successful in production is not something that you do overnight. It is a long game. It is a grind. It is grit. It is all the things that you have to push in because even it takes the numbers. It takes you know, the Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, I believe that. To get better, you have to get the reps. You have to do the time and do the work. And then things begin to snowball. The Mo Buttle book, the snowball. Yeah, thing. yeah. Like, like things, it continues to build on itself. And you don't realize it at the time you're doing it, but I thought the great, you know, the great story that he used to share with me, um, and today we, you know, we call it the microwave age or whatever, and our kids probably feel it because it's even more time compressed, but we used to talk about the instant grips, right? It's, um, you can put instant grit, you can put a bag of grits and some water in a, in a microwave, throw it in the microwave, and they're ready in two or three minutes, stir them up, and you're ready to go. They taste pretty good, but if you sit on the stove and just cook them and do it the right way, the old-fashioned way, they taste really good. And by the way, you can control the, the consistency, you can control other things, you can you can add a little salt, add a little things, but you get to take the time to make it the way you want to make it. And, you know, we tend to forget that today a lot of times with it, looking for instant gratification and the things that we do. But relationships are built over time. And the most successful salespeople are relationship oriented. It doesn't mean they're always expressive like I tend to be. It doesn't mean that they're always drivers or analytics, but they can be anything. But that consistency is there. Yeah. And they keep investing. One of the things I've heard you talk about is how business development is about providing solutions about being helpful, you know, are those the kind of things you're talking about doing day in and day out and sticking to it to, to play that long game? There, yeah, there's a numbers game in every game. You've got to get the at-bats. We talked about it, uh, you know, as well. What do you call a 300 hitter that spends 15 years in the major leagues and averages 300? You call him a Hall of Famer when he's done. I mean, you know, there's a lot of failure in that business, but the consistent, you still, you still step up the bat. You get up there every day to try to get it done. You know, in our business, I do believe sales is about providing and solving problems. Um, and relationships are about solving problems. And it happens to be when there's an insurance solution or some risk management consulting gig or something, that's when we get paid. But you get to meet a lot of people and, and a lot of different things that come at you that, you know, from your experiences from others that you can provide solutions to that make you feel good emotionally, um, fundamentally in the relationship. You understand the value of what you're trying to do that sometimes often lead toward you know, you may never sell them something or that person may not be at that position, shows up somewhere else, but they remember you as well. So that's the investment in the business in your time. Um, and again, not giving up in that process and having the grit to kind of grow through it. At the same time, I think you need to realize pretty quickly in these processes, there's only so many hours in a day and there's only so many relationships you can build on. There are some that you need to walk away from for mutual reasons. Yeah, this was fantastic, Reed. Just such a power packed episode. People are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to say thank you. Uh, you know, do, are you okay with people reaching out by email, LinkedIn, things like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Well, we'll put those down in the show notes, folks. And uh, that way, I'll let you reach out to Reed. He's growing a really big team right now. He's in, uh, he's, yeah. So I'll, we'll get into all that stuff in a future episode. But let me leave it at that. Reed, man, this has been a great episode. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Everybody, Mo Bunnell here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Hey, this is the second of five episodes with Reed Davis. He's CEO of McGriff, one of the largest brokerages in America. And he's been, uh, and Reed, I, I think what's neat about having you on the show is you have been one of the most successful producers I've ever met and worked with. And now you're a CEO building that production focused sales culture growth oriented culture, which is really exciting. So I think this is a fun episode for me to ask you this question. 
What's your personal definition of business development? I, I love that question um, when you presented it earlier because it made me think. It made me think about the, the first call I had when they made me the CEO or asked me to be the CEO or I accepted the role of CEO because it took a while because I wasn't sure that that was something for me. Um, it wasn't something I really truly ever aspired to because I enjoyed leadership, I enjoyed sales, I enjoyed working in the field with people, and I still am doing that for a little bit. It was almost a battlefield promotion with some of the things that were going on. Um, but having connectivity with clients is, is, you know, is the penultimate of any career in any profession. That is the driver. So when you ask that question about business development, and the first call I had, and you know, we, we were a company that had been the highest and best performing in the sales development and metrics and the things that you have going on, and we pivoted to a more operational rated. There was a lot of frustration going on in our business. So now we're turning around and pivoting back when you put a guy that's um, a production-based guy, new business guy, development guy to lead of the organization. I'm not real good when it comes to the IT calls and HR calls and those things, but when it talks about growth, which is where we're focused on, I think I'm, I'm pretty good at that. So the challenge I put to all our business development professionals is real simple. Your job is to make payroll. Not just your own, but everybody's. Um, salespeople need the most successful salespeople and what I believe that every salesperson needs to strive to be is a leader. You know, they own the revenue and revenue is sitting next to their name uh, when it comes down to it. But that doesn't give them the right to be a jerk or anything else. But they have a lot of people counting on them to deliver. As you move into the organizational structure and the things, we become enablers to allow those people to be successful. But if, in today's world, everybody, you're seeing it, everybody, it is, there's talent wars and everything going on. So if you're going to attract and you're going to reward and you're going to be a successful producer or person out there, your team has to want you to be as successful as you, as, as you want yourself to be. It requires that effort. So being able to cultivate around that and knowing that it's not just about you and your responsibility is for that team is critically important. You know, the other line that I like to use, Mo, and I'll say it, you know, from a leader, if you're going to be a leader, which I believe a business development person is, um, leaders eat last, right? They can either eat well or they don't eat at all, but they get to, they need to make sure that the others are taken care of in their world if they really want to be successful. So I think business development and leadership go hand in hand. Oh, I love this. So, so then, then let's go, let's go talking about the future you're creating. I know from talking with you that you're bringing so many of your leaders along to help shape where you want to take McGriff, getting that sales or that growth oriented culture back in where the way you want it to be. What are the, some of the things you recommend to somebody that, that they're, they're, they're trying to create a more growth oriented culture? What would you tell them to focus on? How would you tell them to build that? You know, I think it, it comes back to really understanding your mission and uh, um, your value prop to the business and, and getting the people and back to the teamwork, getting those around you to own the relationships with you and support you in, in, from your own growth, sharing what your goals and objectives are, understanding, you know, how many times have we heard sales doesn't understand operations, doesn't understand support, understanding the unique challenges of delivering what you say we're going to deliver. Where are the bottlenecks? Where are the problems? Who's having a bad day? You know, I never believe Mo, that anybody walks out of their front door saying, I'm going to have a crappy day today. I'm going to mess something up. I believe people have bad days. I believe certain things happen. But having that support and making sure that the others that are there to support the delivery for client service, we're in the financial services industry, so I don't have a product per se. I'm not building a car. I'm not doing certain things to get people to work. I'm not building a bicycle or whatever. We're building a financial model and a solution to support people when there's a problem. And by the way, we have certain situations where we have a third party, which is our insurance product that doesn't always respond the way we or the client may want it to be. So being able to understand and have open and honest dialogue is really important. Um, so I think it's, you know, I, I, I guess it's just understanding and having a somewhat of an empathetic mind as well. You don't have to be soft to be empathetic. Um, but there's people on both sides that are trying really hard and they're going to have a, an invested interest in your success. I love that line. Uh, you don't have to be soft to be empathetic. I really, I've never heard anybody say that before. I really like that. So if I, but if I go back to the enabling sales, enabling uh, delivery uh, of services, creating that great client experience, it seems like what you're doing is 
a lot of times people think about customer experience or client experience, and that's really great. Um, and you guys have a great, you have great version of that because your people care so much. But it also seems like what you're building is a producer experience, a delivery experience, a customer serving. You're eliminating uh, friction. You're you're taking things out of the way. You're making it easier to find, um, create value, obtain, and and create great service for all your clients. It seems like that's sort of where you're headed. Is that right? That is the objective. It's to it's to put the sales and service teams in the front of the organization and not behind the leadership. Uh, of, or from a top-down approach. It's a bottom-up. I'm a firm believer that the solutions in the best companies are driven from the field and the bottom-up. They're given guidance and guardrails on how to do that. Uh, we have a pretty unique business and there's 120 offices in some very different markets in there. And we have to embrace the uniqueness of individuals that are in those offices or their demographic or geographic challenges that they may have. Um, but then allowing us, again, as I said it earlier, I'm an enabler now, which is kind of interesting to try to feel that out and to get your, you know, I, I have to measure success and from affirmation and feedback than I am going to do it necessarily. I get to see the bigger scoreboard and the ultimate results of that. But that too is a long process. You know, if you don't turn a big, you know, a couple million dollars here or there on a billion dollar organization, you don't feel as much. But you can start to see it. You can see the momentum building. So it's all about momentum and it's about getting the, the right people. You know, we, again, another great book, which the timeless book, Good to Great. It's not just about your people. It's about the right people. And, and being able to have those tough discussions with folks that are in certain roles and either understanding what their task has been and what they're going to do, but trying to either get them to understand where we have to go together or making those tough decisions can be hard as well. But that's also... That layers over into business development, right? You, not every client is a great client. Um, not every prospect's a great prospect, even though they're certainly a prospect. So understanding that's important too to help maintain the culture. Yeah, I love this. Yeah, Reed, this has been great. Hey, where should people go if they want to reach out to you? Say thanks for the episode, the insights. But maybe a lot of people actually want to join the kind of company you're building too. So where should they reach out? I'm happy for them to reach me on my email at rdavis at mcgriff.com pretty simple uh or linkedin i'm on linkedin you can find me there as well awesome well we'll put we'll put the, your linkedin url down in the show notes everybody in rdavis at mcgriff.com easy to remember read this has been fantastic everybody don't forget follow subscribe turn on those notifications all the stuff for the show because we've got three more amazing episodes coming up with reed davis thanks reed thanks man Everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Man, I've just been having a blast with Reed Davis. He's CEO of McGriff, one of the largest brokerages in the country. And what I think is interesting about Reed is that not only he's been one of the most successful producers I've ever met, but now he's CEO and he's creating a, an organization focused on growth in a way that I haven't seen before. So with that context, Reed, um, you've gone through Gerbic training, you've read the Snowball System. What's your favorite science stepper story? You know, there's, I think the culmination of all of it, but I think the one that has always resonated with me the most, and I know it was fun early on, though, when you were getting cranked up to do the HBDI training and all the different types of things, because I believe, you know, successful business development and sales is psychology, right? Understanding not just yourself, and I think it's critical that you understand who you are and what and how you learn and how you communicate and a natural because that's your default mechanism whenever you get challenged you get nervous or whatever's going to happen and we've all had those moments in a in a boardroom or a meeting or a presentation where it's like oh my gosh what, what's happening today you default to what is natural or you get challenged in a way that's a little uncomfortable you know i had to realize i'm an expressive when you challenge me i'm usually going to come out fighting so i'm going to defend my territory but that's not what everybody else is going to do so i think to me the most impactful Thing through all this, and, and, and again, to steal the name of your book, the snowball effect, all these things build on each other, right? There's no, there's no one part of it that's more important than the other. They're all, there's some that are longer, there's some that maybe I need a little more work at. The psychology is really important. Understanding who I'm pitching to or talking to or getting to know and asking a few key questions to be able to figure out real quickly what they're natural dynamic is and their psychological profile is really important to me that's probably been where i believe the most of my success has come from yeah people yeah. Are, oh my god that means you're a chameleon no it doesn't it means you you have a better chance right of getting into it if you understand how they buy 
you know, they're in the four quadrants and all the things that we do. We talk a lot about it. There's no right or wrong. They just are what they are. And so how you learn to communicate, and it fits into that numbers game that we all have to use in sales, right? If, if I'm going to be me all the time, then I'm probably going to eliminate 75% of the prospects I ever talk to because we're not going to get along. But being able to expand that number, being able to get into their world makes it a lot easier. And because I've laughed a lot, even though I'm an expressive and everybody thinks I ought to be going a certain way. I, I claim one client in my career as a true cold call. Now, that being said, I've called a lot of people that didn't know me, but you find different ways to warm it up, to do certain things, but it gets in those numbers and you can find out a little bit about the person before you call them even then. So it gives you a head start on the psychology. So I think that has always been the most impactful part of the business is under, being able to quickly understand who the person is that you're talking to and not just pitching things out. Yeah. Well, the, well I love this. So let's roll with it. Um, and by the way, I, well, I want to say something I think is really interesting, and I'll come back with a question. You also mentioned, we talked about HBDI and the ability to flex into different thinking styles and things like that, the psycho psychological nature of it. But you also mentioned the, the comprehensive nature of the system, too. Like, this is a discipline. This is a profession. This is something where you're always dialing in one aspect. And as you said that, Reed, it made me realize the two people that in this season, which we'll end up with 30 some episodes that of, of amazing rainmakers, the two people that have mentioned the comprehensive nature of the system are both CEOs. So I think that's just interesting. You and, and Bill Ruprecht, who's CEO of Sotheby's. Um, so back back to back to HPDI flexing things like that. We've talked about HPDI on the show many times, so we don't have to like decode it or teach anybody that. But I'm just interesting at a high level. You personally, and you don't even have to use our words or vernacular or anything, when you're meeting somebody for the first time, what are you doing personally to try to figure out they think differently than me, I want to flex to the way they want to say yes to this particular next step as opposed to the way you would say yes? Um, I hate to use stereotypes, but there are a lot of stereotypical things that just become obvious with people and some of it's the environment that you're sitting in. So my, I always like going to the place where that person works, resides or whatever. You get a sense, I mean, if you looked around my office right now, you'd get a real clear picture of the scattered nature of my personality, right? You go into certain things that you can pick up on. There's some questions that you can ask in the early processes to start to determine you know, you can throw out a process-based question. Tell me how you've made your decision to get to this point, why you do certain things. And you can tell by their answer what they may, how they have gone about it. If they were very analytical, they'll, they'll walk you through a very natural process. If it was relational oriented or it was about a certain problem, and if they, you see flexion in their voice or certain aspects of how they respond to you, you can start to look up pretty quickly as to what their natural tendencies are. Oh, I really like that. So you're you're getting really deep uh, into the words they're using. How how are how are they describing their past or whatever question you ask? It's just exactly how you should do it. So let's now let's circle back to the comprehensive nature. You're you're coaching um, you know you're coaching producers all the time at scale now, right? Because you're running the entire organization. And one of the things that we believe that you believe is that business development, production, sales, whatever we want to call it, it is a profession, it is a discipline, it is something that you're never perfect at, you're always trying to get better at, the Gladwell 10,000 hours rule, uh, all the research behind that kind of stuff. What themes are you seeing in the world that people could get better at? <laughs> I think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier. It is about not, not trying to measure success in 30 days, 60 day or 90 day increments. I think it's about, it's truly aligning your goals and then recognize you know, your life goals, your long-term goals, the things that are built around what success is. I'm never going, and I, I'm very clear about this with a lot of the producers, I can help you set goals. I cannot define success for you. You have to define success. So if, if they don't align, if, you know, it's, it's real easy. I'll never forget in an early part of, and I hope I'm not deviating here too far, in the early part of my career, I had a gentleman ask me, he said, Reed, what are your, what are your sales goals? And I told him, and he says, well, ask me what, tell me what success is and lifetime goals are. And I told him what it was. He says, Reed, you're never going to get there. I said, what do you mean? He goes, your activity base is not enough, and you need to work on those. So 
So at that point in time, my career, I, I pivoted toward having to figure out how to create more activity. And then you have to, once you start realizing, all right, that's working, now it is, where am I missing? You know, when every professional baseball player, even if he hits 300, watching tapes of the swings when he didn't hit the ball. So revisiting things that aren't working, are there consistencies in why I'm not getting to the next level with certain types of people? Are there things that are going on that I can do better? And I think that's, you know, and again, Mo, I, I, your book, you know, the Grow Big and the things that go on, I can't sit here and recite any specific part, but I can remember and go pull it out and go, I need to revisit this, right? That's when you become comprehensive. I got this part of it down, but I got to remember what I'm not doing here. So there's ways to pull it out and go, let's go get, spend a thousand hours on that this time and, you know, wherever it may be. Um, so to me, that's, that's the beauty of it uh, and being able to, to figure out if you're not taking enough time to understand where things are not going right, right or where they are going right and what you can repeat and what you can eliminate, then you're going to, you're going to waste a lot of time. Oh man, I think that's great. And there's a, there's sort of in what you're saying, there's sort of a perpetual growth mindset. There's like a, 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 we're never done. It's that there's always something to get better at and achieve what the next level of your goals is. And I just think that's, I think that's probably one of the key reasons you're so successful is you just keep finding the next thing to go tackle. So re, yeah. So people are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to say, thank you for this episode. I have a feeling some people might be watching or listening and go, hey, I actually want to join Reed's team over there, McGriff. Um, where should they go to do that? Yeah, feel free to send me an email, rdavis at mcgriff.com or through LinkedIn. Happy to, happy to connect on LinkedIn as well. I love it. Well, we'll put all that. We'll put all that in the show notes, everybody. If you're barreling down the highway, you don't have to worry about trying to write it down. But we'll put those in the show notes so you can get them later. Hey, Reed, thanks for being on the show. We got two more coming up, folks. These have been great. This is our third of five. Two more coming. Reed, thank you. You bet. Thank you, Mo. Hey, everybody. Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm having a blast with Reed Davis. He's not only one of the most successful producers I've ever met, but he's been elevated to the level of CEO at McGriff, one of the largest brokerages in the nation. Reed, I love this fourth question in, in this season because it just, it, the, the, all, this episode always ends up being the most inspiration, inspirational of the five questions we ask of each person. So here you go. I know you don't like talking about yourself, you just have to do it. I'm forcing you to do it. Tell me of a business development story you're personally proud of. I'm going to start by telling you there's a bunch. And I hate saying that. And, and I thought about this, and I appreciated the advance. And I had one that I was really proud of, and then I thought about another. And I think they all have a theme, and then I will get into one, right? I, I had formerly worked for one of the largest brokerage firms in the world, and uh, when I came to McGriff, at the time, there were only 10 of us in the Atlanta office. Today, there's 150 of us. We have the, probably the second largest group of people in Atlanta doing what we do. Um, it's significant. We were less than a million dollars today. It's over $82 million, $85 million of revenue in Atlanta. It's a billion-dollar company. All these fun things that we can talk about. But it's time, and we still get, a lot of times, we are David going up against Goliath. But when I look back at some of the wins, and I'm going to rattle off three or four, with a statement, then I'm going to focus on one, but you'll see what I'm talking about. So, 1996, Ron Stodd's doing the Olympic program for the staffing company. Our big competitors doing all this for them didn't pay attention to what they needed to do or what they needed to do in this program. We put the program together, became good friends. Now, the former risk manager of that firm actually works for us today, um, but we got to be friends. But it was another one, it was one of those, okay, the the nimbleness, right? The creativity, the things that went on to getting that done was really cool. TPA Realty, which is a local firm here in Atlanta, longest tenured client I have, one of the most brilliant real estate minds in, in America runs that firm, Brad Smith, giving him a selfless plug. Um, but it wasn't Brad that got me into the business. It was a fellow named Scott Hawkins. But when I do, predominance of my clients are in the real estate space. But it allowed me a training mechanism because they were just messy and, and your real estate guys could be messy and all things. Were, we solved the problem. It became transferable for a lot of others. It allowed me to dig into a business 
to understand what their problems were. So it was a development. So you're continuing to leap your career into certain spaces. So that's what these wins are about, right? And there became a, there was a company in, it was probably in 2000 of Sunterra Resorts. Here we are, a little firm competing with, for the largest privately held timeshare company in the world. They're in London. There's a disaster going on. They can't get anything done. We get the broker record letter five days before their renewal. Biggest broker in the world is trying to put the foot on us, kill people in the marketplace. We were on the phone with the guys in London. And there was an individual that supported us, got the deal done, and we saw it because we had the audacity to think we could get it done, and we got it done. Again, taking you to the next step. David now is able to play in the field with Goliath a little bit. We can make this happen. It gives you the courage to take on the next one. Then there was Westgate Resorts, which has a similar type approach to it. Uh, and move forward, and now it's still a long climb, and we've helped them grow. But in that relationship and process, a few years ago, they had the fire in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. It burned a $180 million resort, burned to the ground. We had a checks in their pockets. They were able to help their people. So I look at that one while that relationship is very deep for the people because I care about the people. You got to help them care about their folks. And so it's an interesting different win. We already had the business, but it, it gives you that fulfillment of why we do what we do. But the one that's probably the most, that I'm probably most proud of, both from an individual and an organization, is a casino out in Las Vegas. We handled the Cosmopolitan. This was coming out of the, the crisis. That property had, was owned by Deutsche Bank. It was a foreclosure. Um, there's a, we obviously work for a, a, a firm that's owned and run, was owned by BBNC, now it's part of Truist. Um, we're in New York traveling around doing this bank to bank discussion. And we went to, Deutsche Bank, we went to Goldman, we went to JP Morgan, all these people, because what we knew was they were trying to do something on behalf of BBT to do a bond offering. But we're meeting with all the real estate people because I'm the real estate guy and with, with our team. And they talked about, Deutsche Bank um, gentlemen talked about these assets they have because most of their business they syndicated, they didn't own a lot of assets. We said, we got this thing sitting out in Vegas, we're not real sure what we're gonna do with. It was supposed to call, cost us $2 billion to build, it cost $4 billion after everything else. It's, right into the financial crisis, it's complete re redevelopment. So they said, look, we'll introduce you to the team out there, but you gotta go figure it out. And so we went out to Vegas, met them real quick. They said, oh, that sounds pretty good. But we listened to all their problems again that they were having. They needed a professional. They were way down the road with who they thought they were gonna pick, but we were able to find, but fortunately I happened to know somebody that needed, they needed a risk manager, he happened to be in Vegas. We were able to, I got him to come home from Mexico early to at least interview with him. But the whole process going through this, just listening and bringing it together, when we came out to do the presentation, we brought a company paradigm, we broke the paradigm by bringing the people from all over to show them what we could do. There was a fear, you know, this is the funny part is when we showed up, I had people from our Dallas office, Atlanta, different places. And unfortunately this showed me also something we had to work on as an organization. We looked like three or four different companies. So I spent all that night at Kinko's getting our presentation to look right. Um, so we show up the next morning, we present it, we pitch it, and we were hired. And to think about that, you know, to get that deal done, and we thought we could deliver, there was a very unique product because of the balconies and things on it. We addressed it and got it done. And today, I'm, you know, I'm going to fast forward for you, you know, and I got to spend the opening night there. You know, we got to see all these things. So there was a true value in the relationship because they saw what we were able to do. But the best part of this sales story was four years later, they sell to Blackstone. So Blackstone, they couldn't do anything with us the first year and weren't sure what they wanted us to do. But they come in and they say, well, we don't know these guys real well. They do real well, but we don't know much about them. So they brought this competition through the process with every intent on getting rid of us. The best part was when we were done through all this, they were recommending us back to the buyer is the broker of choice. And it wasn't anything else. And it was not because we'd earned it. And our, my partner, you know, the people inside going, we never wanted to fire them anyway, but it validated what we had done. It brought all those things together around we did it, which subsequently led us to doing a big part of Blackstone's program, right? They began to be partners. They started looking at us and, and some of the things that they had to say were really, really pretty cool. So I use that one as a great example. Now, the sad part of it is, they have so the casino will be sold uh, in June or July to MGM. We won't survive that deal. But one of the last gentlemen out there that's been a big fan of ours, and we actually, he was on our payroll, we put him in there at one point in time. He now 
when I mentioned Westgate a minute ago, he now is going to work for Westgate in Las Vegas. So it's all about the connectivity of relationship yeah. and adding value um, in the process. So I use that one for a lot of different reasons as both a life success story, but also a life story on why you have to play the long game, uh, why you don't burn bridges. That is so weird. You saw me smile because I literally was writing play the long game. The E of game was I was writing, as you said, play the long game, <laughs> which is crazy. Well, I just heard so many lessons in that being nimble, being a problem solver, focusing on relationships, going above and beyond. I think of a late night at Kinko's, you know, drinking Red Bull or whatever you did to get through the connectivity of everything, you know, the people recommending you and checking you out and hearing a great reference. Um, and then, of course, playing the long game. If you, you know, if you told that story to a young producer and they were just getting their legs underneath them and they and they were trying to, you know, persevere every day to, to find those people to talk to, to start to build a book of business, what would be sort of your key lessons or key things you would say, hey, as I told this story, I hope you heard this. What would be the this? Well, they heard a lot about me talking about what happened. What they didn't see was how we, mo there were a lot of people didn't think we could get it done. The team was the success story. It wasn't me. It was about getting and listening. One, it's listening and what we talked about in the last episode about understanding the buyer, listening to what they needed to hear, what they were talking about they needed. They didn't need, they were a startup, right? They didn't need, they weren't an operating company that had a lot of things figured out. They needed that. They needed the help, but we listened real well and we put team people and we got people motivated to deliver. Uh, because they recognized the, the, the opportunity that was there. So it was it was not the typical just get in there and try to figure it out. It was it was solving problems. Were we gonna make money at it? We weren't even sure what you know what the economic structure was necessarily gonna look at, but we knew it was going to take us to a different level if we got this deal done. And everybody bought into what this opportunity meant for us if we got it done. And it truly played out that way when it's led to some other business and other opportunities. And it took us again, when I talked about each one taking to a next level and that when you mentioned the growth mindset, um, and it allowed us to do things where we weren't sure we could do, but gives you the confidence to go do something. Uh, Reed, this is, this has been fantastic. That, 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 that the fourth episode this year, this kind of story from all kind of folks, it's just so inspirational. I'm fired up. So hey, if people are going to want to, to reach out to you, they're going to want to say, thank you for this inspiration. They might even want to join the team of people that you're helping do more things like this, where should they go? Uh, I'd love for them to send me an email at rdavis at mcgriff.com or please reach out through LinkedIn. Uh, you can learn more about us that way too. Fantastic. We'll put that down. We'll put your email and LinkedIn URL down in the show notes, folks, so you can find it. So, hey, everybody, don't forget, subscribe, follow the show, turn on those notifications. we got one more big, chunky episode with Reed Davis coming up next. Thanks, Reed. You bet. Thank you, Mo. Hey everybody, Mo Bunnell here. I'm smiling because I'm just having a blast talking with Reed Davis. He's not only one of the most enjoyable people I've ever been around, he's one of the most successful producers that I ever got to work with. And now he's CEO of McGriff, one of the largest brokerages in the country. And uh, I just think that's really exciting. So Reed, um, I think with that background, when I think of your athletic history, when I think of the success you've had as a producer, as a, as a regional leader uh, for the entire Southeast or the state of Georgia, now CEO of the billion dollar company. If you had to, or if you could record a video around business development, growth skills, production, sales, whatever you want to call it, and send it back to your younger self, what message would you send back to your younger self? That's, that's interesting because I think it ties into a lot of things that we talked about in the first four episodes. And it, and it really does come back to something that's really hard to see because we can't see around the curve, but we can think about where we want to go. Um, one is start earlier <laughs> in a lot of these things and your investment in yourself and time and energy is, you know, we tend to as young kids and want to, we, we spend a lot of time trying to figure things out. And it doesn't mean and, and, I, and I share this with a lot of young guys and girls coming out of college today. Part of it's just getting in the jet stream. You know, figure that there's certain things. Don't think you have to have it figured out today. Because even at six years old, I sit here right now, I don't have it figured out. Um, don't be afraid to admit what you don't know. Even in today's world. To me, you know, one of the things that I'm so proud of our current senior leadership team, which I'm, you know, some people I'm getting to know better, 
um, if we create an environment of challenging each other and ask questions. And I get calls every day, all day, from people that I don't even know. I don't know who they are, or what they're really asking. So, you know, I think we. So, I guess in in, in essence, is is don't let pride be your um, and don't let pride be your deterrent for being successful. And I think that's where we run into a lot of things. And the other thing too is people will try to define you uh, along the way, and people will try to give you certain things. But stay true to who you are, and you define success in your own right. Um, I operate under some things that I learned in another program, Mo, when I, you know, I kind of stole it from part of it from an individual and, you know, the five F's that we try to do and the, the balance, you know, one of the things I learned from my wife early on in our marriage was that we started talking about balance, right? And everybody wants to talk about balance, especially in today's world with the COVID, the pandemic and everything else. Oh my God, all these things that are going on. Well, the reality is no two people have the same balance. They don't it's because of different things. And there are five facets that I think we all live by, and they go by us, right? You have faith, family, finance, fitness, and fun. All those things make up your life. But you don't do 20% on each and every day. So you've got to figure out which day. There may be 100% of your day. One day is spent all around the finance. There may be 100% of your one day is spent all around family. But you have to figure out what your balance is and how you define success in that way. It's not going to be determined for you. Uh, but yet there's a lot of, and I read a lot of books and read yours, read everything, uh, all those stuff. But there's a lot of people that are going to tell you uh, what success means, but it does, and that may mean what it is to them. And you can take nuggets away from each one. Um, you know, there was the, 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 there was a podcast recently that was done by the, the sports psychologist for the University of Georgia football team that was talking about this year's team. What I, and I thought it was awesome. And it was just an ad hoc podcast, kind of like you're doing now. But there's a saying that I took away that hit me between the ears. When people start talking about, when, when they ask you, what is success? What's it going to take? And the only thing I could think about was it takes what it takes. And so that's, if I could, if I could tell my old self that, my young self that, when you're trying to put it together, when they're trying, you're looking for the secret sauce, you're looking for the formula, you're looking for why, it takes what it takes. And that's what you yeah. have determined. Well, I'll we'll 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 post the link to that episode in the show notes. I thought it was fantastic. You had told me about it, so my wife and I listened to it on the way home from um, uh, going to see our daughter in in Durham, and we just both loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Well, let let me ask you this: um, when you think of the five F's, faith, family, finance, fitness, and fun. So hopefully, hopefully I got those five right. How do you set goals yourself? I'm interested in that. I think that's a great ending for this episode. I've probably not done as well lately as I used to, but it was, you know, it, it, to me, it always, for a long time in my life, it started with financial because that allows you to then do the other thing, right? It allows you to give more for your faith development things that you do. It, it, it invests in your fun. It supplies your family with the lifestyle and the things that they want to live and the things that they want to do. Um, and then, it, you know, then fitness, but if you're not careful, fitness can be a detriment, you know, obviously you can hurt yourself by spending too much time. So I learned the balance and, and I set life goals. And, and again, it was one of the things that I started working on years ago. It's not about what I try not to look at things in, as I move forward, as much as I look at things from the end coming back, you know, Covey said it, begin with end in mind. There's other jet destination type journeys and you know, one of the things that people taught me is like, look, it ultimately, it, instead of thinking about what I want to be doing now at 60, I still think about what it is that I want it to look like when I'm done, right? When I'm 90. In order to get there, I got to do these things around fitness. So it becomes just motivational to try to stay in shape, eat better. And by the way, my body's falling apart. <laughs> so I, I have to deal with that. But it also gives you the perspective of finding whatever your faith is and finding time to bury yourself into something because the emotional, you know, emotional impact on all the other things that go on in your life. My kids are growing up, you know, they, their needs change. Being able to learn how to balance the family dynamic that continues to change is really important. Um, you know, so, and that plays into the fun aspect of it. So, you know, it's, it's, it, I do set things out as I go through it. I'm not, I'm really not the guy that sits down and writes 10 pages of goals in December, January. 
I have some fundamental things that I review every year and then say, okay, what am I going to do this year to do better uh, and self-improve and the things around those aspects. I look at areas of my life where I feel like I've gotten out of balance and make a commitment to get some of those things back. Um, and so that's, that's important for me. And, and there are times when you recognize, when you do that, you recognize how whack, out of whack you really are in some aspects of your life and how why those things, other aspects of your life are going sideways because you're not truly investing in some of, some, some, some of the pieces that keep you balanced. Yeah, well, that's perfect. And, and another gem, so I, a couple things you said, I just have to reiterate to the audience, I thought it was so good, but look, at the, look from the end and come back to what you need. I thought that was brilliant. And yeah, I know Covey said, Covey said, begin with the end in mind, and it's one of the seven habits and all that. But just the way you set it around setting goals, I think is really poignant. The other thing is, for everybody, I think just having a rubric that that you think about your life in in buckets like this: faith, family, finance, fitness, fun. If you know, you probably if somebody's driving down the road listening to this right now, they think, "Oh man, I'm I'm out of balance in one of those," or "I'm a little over indexing on one of those." And just looking at it across those that spectrum, I think is really helpful. So I know you just do it. You just do it all the time naturally, and it works. It works. So Reed, man, this has been awesome. People are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to want to say thank you for the insights. They're going to want to potentially join your team in the growth-oriented culture that you're building at McGriff. Where should they go? I'd love for them to send me an email. They can do it at rdavis at mcgriff.com, or they can reach through LinkedIn. Either way, I'm happy to accept the message either way. That's perfect. And we'll put that down in the show notes. And, hey, everybody, we'll put that um, that UGA, the, the, the guy who leads – all of the sort of the winning team mindset for the University of Georgia football team. Um, of course, they just won the national championship this year as we record this. Um, we'll, he recorded a great podcast, Reed shared it with me. I watched it or listened to it, excuse me, with my wife. We loved it. We'll put that down in the show notes too. Reed, you've been awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Mo. I appreciate the opportunity.